So what I'd now like to do is uh, introduce uh, Paul, Paul Flatters, who's uh, the CEO and founder of uh, Trajectory uh, Partnership. Now, Paul has got a fascinating background um, and brings a huge amount of uh, experience and expertise. So 20 years uh, or more of uh, experience in advising strategic implications of, um, uh, of economic uh, change to businesses. Um, he's had a, a very colourful career uh, working for organisations uh, such as Head of Research at the BBC News, Director of Research for Witch and Consumer Association, uh, and has previously been CEO of the uh, Future Foundation and Director of the Henley Centre for Forecasting. So uh, I'd like to welcome uh, Paul up on stage and uh, look forward to hearing what you have to say. Thank you very much. I think that deserves a round of applause. <laughs> Uh, thanks, everybody. It's a great pleasure to be here, particularly following this charming man here, who was one of my colleagues at, uh, at the Hamley Centre um, many years ago. Um, in my, uh, my role here this evening is to pick up where Chris left off in terms of the uh, B, uh, B2C, um, B2, B2B uh, picture and, and talk about B2C. And actually, um, there, are, there are some parallels, actually, with the way Chris started his presentation, some of the optimism, yes, actually thinking first of all about, think about growth, and I should get this in early, I suppose, that there, I think there is a platform for growth with consumers right now, but I think I'm conscious that a lot of things I'm going to talk about are the challenges, and I think inevitably that's the thing to focus on, the, the challenges that we face in this post-recessionary environment with marketing con to consumers. But the growth is there, and if you think about where we might have been, um, you know, we started, we started Trajectory as a business in September 2008. I signed the deal on our offices the same week that Lehman Brothers went bust. That's good forecasting for you. Um, now, you know, where we might have been, we might have been in a whole worse place. So I'm just kind of conscious of some of the things I'm going to talk about are a bit challenging, but there is an absolute parallel of what Chris was talking about. People kind of stung a bit by the experience of the last few years. Uh, and that will continue, and I think will be a feature of the landscape going forward. But some signs, some signs of optimism. So, going forward, um, I'm going to say a little bit about the global context. The main focus of my remarks will be about the UK consumer and marketing to the UK consumer, but um, actually pick up again on some of the themes that Chris, that Chris introduced. Talk about the state of the UK consumer economy. I'm not going to go into details about um, you know, uh, inflation forecasts in great, in great detail. It's just more about the consumer reaction uh, to the economy, uh, particularly in that third section around the consumer psyche, and then wrap it up reasonably quickly with a few thoughts about what all this might mean for marketing going forward. And to have in mind, um, you know, my specialism is understanding trends uh, in, in consumer behaviour, and to understand how the impact of the economy has been much greater than on economic trends. You know, the, the economy has obviously had huge impacts on lots of other trends, and trying to disentangle as we come into this new phase where the things are looking much more optimistic economically, about which of those um, trends that we've seen influencing consumer behaviour are going to continue on their merry way. You know, there might be some trends that we might regard as new normal trends. Discretionary thrift is one of them. But actually, despite the change of economic mood, they're going to continue. Others might turn around quite quickly. Consumer confidence, although our consumer confidence data doesn't show that quite yet. And yet throughout this period, there have been some trends that have just operated independently. They've not really been uh, affected by uh, the downturn that much. You know, if you think about the way that consumers, during the course of this downturn, have embraced smartphones, have embraced tablet computing, for example, you might argue that that blue line there might have been higher up, higher up and to the right, but actually you couldn't, you couldn't really argue for anything other than the kind of triumph of those those technologies throughout this recessionary period. So this is kind of my, as the way I see it as my, as my task, really, with, in advising my clients, is, is how those various trends that are going to shape consumer behaviour, shape how you market to consumers, are going to respond during this, uh, during this period. But first, a little bit about, uh, about the global context, and just putting a bit, actually a bit of data behind some of the remarks that, that Chris made, which I com completely agree with. And to talk about the kind of, uh, what a remarkable transformation we've seen in a relatively short time. This, the, the, the main graph here in the middle, the, the purple and sort of beigey sort of colour, I think we have. I should find a, we use that colour a lot. I should really come up with a name for it. Beige, <laughs> I think it's going to be. Um, the, you just to see that as we turned, as we started this millennium, emerging uh, economies only accounted for about 20% of GDP. 
They currently account for somewhere over a third, getting on for 40%, and towards the end of the decade, that's going to be 50-50. Now, the picture among those emerging economies in that time has changed remarkably. This is the point that Chris was making, that you, know, you can't assume that the growth in these markets is just going to be upwards. There's much more volatility. You need to pick and choose very carefully. And the plethora of new acronyms, um, you know, Jim O'Neill is, is making a one-man uh, business out of this, uh, replacing BRICS with, is it MIS or is it MINTS, your Mexico, um, Indonesia, Turkey, and Nigeria. Um, that there's a, so there's a, pre a plethora of new, of new acronyms and new possibilities uh, coming along. But, but overall, this, this progression to um, the emerging economies taking a greater share of global GDP. Um, and just a couple of things to pick out from this slide. These are some of the the sort of forecasts about the uh, trajectories of, of, of the performance of some of those uh, economies. You know, China in the light blue, uh, and we've got the thing to point out, is the ones that are doing well will be um, above this kind of dotted line here, which is the overall average growth for the world. As so anything doing above that is outstripping world growth, anything below it is performing less well uh, than, than world growth. But a few things, even those uh, economies and regions that are doing well, Clearly, China is still growing very, very strongly, but are cooling off in China. And an area like Sub-Saharan Africa, for example, thought to be towards the end of this period, really doing well, and possibly, for those of you who do market globally, something to have on your, uh, have on your radar. Um, but I think those are the main points to come out of there. Not a great, not a great uh, getting closer to home, actually, not a great forecast for the euro area, but rather more optimistic for, for Eastern Europe, uh, quite interestingly. But for all that change, and it has been dramatic, you know, you, you, you could call it, I think, quite legitimately an economic revolution. Let's not get too carried away. If you look at the GDP per head figures for some of these emerging markets and some of the kind of faster growing markets in Europe, they're still incredibly, incredibly tiny. The GDP head per head on these figures, these are World Bank figures, the UK comes in at just under £40,000 per head. Germany comes in at about £44,000 per head. You're still talking about relatively modest average GDPs per head. And you'd across the world, as I've lifted this absolutely shamelessly from a very really good piece uh, in The Economist last week, there were around about, thought to be about 2.8 billion people who are defined as middle class because they're earning 2 to $10 per day. And that makes them uh, interesting to FMCG companies. They'll buy soap, they'll buy branded food, they'll buy, uh, they'll buy drinks, branded drinks. So they become a definition of middle class, but it's not middle class the way that we would recognize it. And there's a great fragility to that. In fact, there's a, some research saying that as, as these markets, emerging markets become volatile, there are people who've, it's not a one-way street, some people dipping back down below that $2 a day. In fact, there, is, there, there are two... There are two billion people below um, two dollars a day, um, still. So that I think it's important to, for all that fantastic kind of global revolution in terms of the transformation of global consumption, to have a bit of a sanity check and a reality check on just what's that, what that's meaning. And indeed, one of the key characteristics, of course, you see uh, in, in emerging markets and indeed some developed markets is an increasing. Um, uh, growth in the uh, income inequality and income polarization, which you know is not um, is not meant as a kind of uh, as a moral uh, point at all. In fact, you know a, a serious or, and august organisation like the World Economic Forum identified uh, income inequality last year as potentially the biggest disruptive factor to the global economy. So it is it is something that we see, and you know we we live in a world where you know Arab Spring onwards. I think it's. It's right to kind of highlight in a lot of these places around the world a crisis of global legitimacy. Some of that is political because people are reacting to, to dictatorships, but certainly some of it is economic. And when you look at those figures that I presented in terms of GDP per head, you could possibly understand why consumers in Brazil might riot if public transport becomes um, increasingly expensive. You may not be able to afford to go to work. Um, so, that, you know, hence, I think it's part of this picture of... Um, a crisis of, of, of legitimacy and, and culture clashes that we see um, around the world. And I'll kind of follow this uh, uh, when I get onto the UK and that there are you know, some economic drivers here, but the economy doesn't operate in isolation. 
And I think it's really interesting the way at the moment that the global economy is interacting with some of these other more social trends uh, and tensions around you know, pro-democracy versus authoritarianism and, and, and how that plays out. Uh, traditional values versus modern values, religious values versus secular values, and so on. I think that's all coming together to um, cause quite a volatile uh, cocktail of, of, of consumer behaviours. Having said all that, I don't want to be a complete doom monger. I realise that sounds quite um, negative. There are some challenges there, but, and the key thing is this revolution, this gradual move towards 50% of global GDP by the end of this decade being uh, taking place in, um, among... Um, among emerging markets. There is some also other, other good news as well. So this is a source of some debate amongst demographers, and when demographers debate, you know, you've really got to take cover. Um, <laughs> that we're about to reach the point, as you probably all know, that Asia has been the main source of population growth, and lots of the scare stories about population time bombs and 9 billion, 10 billion consumers and so on. Actually, it's, it's just an example where we're, we're possibly getting some more good news that actually this year, some demographers say, Next year, the UN demographers say, uh, the, the, the fertility rates in Asia will reach 2.1%, uh, which is a key figure, which is the replacement level. That's, so it's 2.1% among women of uh, childbearing age, and that's the point at which the population stays stable. And we're about to reach that for, the, for the, what has been the big driver of global of global population change. So, you know, some progress being made, and, and you know, by and large, as a business, we're very optimistic about the future. Um, let's get closer to home. I realise I haven't mentioned the euro, but, but perhaps we could talk about that in, in questions, and well, Chris, would, Chris would be keen on it as well. But closer to home, I think depending on, uh, you know, maybe I'm sure everybody here uh, looks at news, news feeds every day of the week, but if, you, if you're a less frequent uh, reader of news than that, you might get one of three different narratives about the state of the UK economy, depending on which day you, um, you looked at your, your app. Um, I think most popular at the moment is a narrative you might call Boomtown Britain, based around uh, fast um, increasing, improving house prices, particularly in the southeast and London, as you know. Uh, the growth in the automotive industry, the British automotive industry, is having a fantastic uh, time of it, although a lot of people suggest it's fueled by PPI payments rather than any kind of fundamental. I think there's a serious point there, actually. There's several billion pounds being injected into the UK economy through that route. And... Joblessness um, as, as, uh, as is coming down, and unemployment is, is coming down. And so some, some, some really good news there. Again, if you get under those statistics and underemployment and um, zero-hours contracts that have been debated endlessly in the last week and so on, maybe, maybe that there's a bit of rose-tintedness around, around, around some of that. But there are two other narratives around the UK economy which I think are also worth considering, and they're not so positive. The first is a cost of living crisis, which again has been in the, in the news this week. We probably have, according to the ONS, just reached the point at which incomes are going to grow at the same rate um, as inflation, although, again, other people did some analysis of that. If you took out city bonuses, then perhaps we're still not growing. And it's the distribution of that. And this is a real theme of what I have to say to you this evening. Is this, this is not, That figure that produ produced by the ONS that... Wage increases in February were 1.7%, inflation was 1.7%. Those are averages. And in different parts of the country, and different, for different types of worker, there are very, very different prospects. And so I think beware, beware, of, the, uh, beware of the average. And then the third narrative is that, um, as far as the public sector is concerned, austerity Britain is still with us and will be with us for the rest of the decade in all likelihood. And so if your business relies on local government workers, teachers, doctors, nurses, um, the chances of them seeing above inflation pay rise in the next four years are pretty much zero. So what's their confidence going to be like uh, and, and how are they going to, be, uh, going to be consuming? So I think that, you know, it, it's, it sounds almost paradoxical, but actually all three of those narratives are true. They, they, just, they live, they, they operate within different sectors of the economy, public versus <coughs> private, um, Macro versus macro versus micro, uh, but, but so they're all true and all are relevant. This is the picture that Chris was talking about, which I think, just to understand the sheer duration and scale of the of the, of the downturn that we talked about. Chris, absolutely right. We're about to come out. So what the, what this shows is basically the shape of every of, of these um, economic 
recessions that we've had. So the 1980s recession in, in purple, so just stick with that. So you see the start of the recession. This is quarters from the beginning of the recession. Um, so you've got a year, two years when we get to eight quarters. And when the line cuts back through the horizontal axis, that's the point at which the economy is as big as it was before we went into downturn. That's the kind of recovery. So that's the, um, the shape of the downturn. We're back, to, we're back to the same size when we cut through the horizontal axis uh, again. And you can see we haven't quite done that yet. Uh, and there's some debate whether it will be Q3 or Q4. It'll certainly be before the general election, I imagine, that we cut through that horizontal axis. But just look, I mean, this has been an incredibly significant, unprecedented event, almost as deep as the Great Depression of the 1930s and much more prolonged. So it, as, a, as an economic experience that is going to shape consumer behavior, it is incredibly uh, sig significant and, and the ramifications of that will echo I think down you know through certainly through um, the medium term there have been some very painful lessons learned by consumers in that period and you know more closer to home let alone the kind of psychological impacts that might have there's actually the real business of, of um, incomes real what real wages actually falling um, so uh, eight and a half percent fall across the UK average but again, a very sort of different picture depending on where you are uh, in the country. So really massive, almost 10% falls in Southwest and, and Northern Ireland. So this very different geographical picture depending on, on where you are. This is the uh, cost of living crisis uh, chart. So you can see we probably just are about at the point where on average, and this is the key point, uh, incomes, uh, uh, growth in incomes is going to catch up with growth in, um, in inflation, particularly if you favour CPI rather than RPI as the government some, for some reason there, so it just seems, seems to do uh, recently, possibly because CPI is a smaller, smaller number. So regional disparities, this is our, um, these are forecasts for growth, this is so the average growth per annum by region um, uh, across the main, the main UK regions out to 2019. Um, with Greater London leading the way, you won't be surprised at an average growth rate of 2.7%. And almost, it doesn't quite work out, the further away you get from London, the smaller those growth rates become. So you get to Northern Ireland and Wales with the lowest growth rates. And a spread there of 1.6 to 2.7% per, per annum. So they may look quite small changes, but actually through the ones of cumulative growth, they would be quite, quite significant changes. But more significant still, of course, is the local picture. So if you, we just, I've just picked out uh, examples of local authority districts from within three regions here, three from Yorkshire and the Humber, three from the North West, and four from, from, from Greater London. And so if you bear in mind here that the, the, the spread was from 1.6 to 2.7, if you break it down, you can see a much greater spread, particularly at the low end. So you've got an area like Richmondshire in Yorkshire and the Humber that effectively isn't forecast to have any growth at all for the next five years. 0.3% you know, is, is really negligible. I don't know if that will help get William Hague re-elected. He's, he's the MP for, for Richmond in North Yorkshire. And uh, much better prospects for Richard, Richmond in Surrey, by the way, for those of you who live in Richmond in, in, in Surrey. Um, uh, but uh, an area like Harrogate, of course, leafy, lovely Harrogate, um, is going to grow at 2.5%, you know, almost ne neck and neck with many, many areas in London. Similar picture in the northwest, an area like Copeland, barely seeing any growth at all, mid growth the Blackpool, and really quite uh, growth in Manchester steaming ahead. The one, the one outlier here, of course, is, is Greater London, where you see different rates of growth, but you don't see the basket cases. You don't see the 0.3s and the 0.6s. You've got, in fact, Lewisham, I think, Lewisham and Lambeth have got the lowest forecasts for London, and they're both coming at about 2.1. So that's the, that's the real outlier. So it's a, it's a, it's a story of, uh, of polarised um, polarized, um, income, you know, depending if you're a public sector worker versus a private sector worker going forward in terms of the recovery. And then a multi-speed recovery, if you look at it at the geographical level, at local and regional level. I think those are the kind of the messages to get out. Um, so what is, how is that impacting on the, the post-recessionary consumer um, psyche? As you can probably guess from the subtle branding here, uh, we're in debt to visit England, our clients, uh, for provision of some, some data that's really hot off the press. We run a monitor for them. Um, understanding holiday intentions and holiday patterns. And in, within that data, we also ask a lot about how consumers are feeling and, the, and, and how confident and different types of confidence and different types of behaviours. And they very kindly let us share this data with you ahead of uh, its formal uh, publication. So we're very grateful to visit England for that. 
And I think this is quite an interesting slide to, to bear in mind. This is uh, people who agree um, that they who say they've been affected by the downturn. To, do, um, to, to what extent do you, do you agree that you've been affected by the downturn? So the purple, it hasn't affected me yet, and I'm really not worrying. Um, the green, it hasn't affected me yet, but I'm con concerned it might do so. Through to it's affected me a little. It's seriously affected me in blue. And I think what this, for those of us who've been working over the last few years, to, to, to bear in mind is that what if, there was a kind of phony war at the start of the economic downturn. Uh, Pre-general um, pre election in 2010, New Labour gave away lots of sweeteners in terms of tax credits and so on. Actually, was spending quite a lot of money while talking austerity. And it's perhaps no, no surprise, therefore, that actually it's only as the, as the real downturn really kicked in um, in March, so from, from sort of 2011 and so on, that um, you, you see the bulk of people starting, you know, more people starting to say they were affected by, by the downturn. And those figures, you know, even though we, we're well into recovery now, and the figures are getting slightly, obviously slightly more optimistic. There's almost as many people as ever who's saying that they're badly affected by the downturn. So in, in terms of our mindset, that's where we still are. And I think that echoes the picture, a little bit the picture that Chris was talking about with business, that somewhat stung by recent experience, we kind of hope for more, uh, but, but a, a, a little bit cautious. There's a similar question which um, we asked, do, do you know, to what extent do you, are you feeling the economic recovery? Uh, and you've got these people in green here, some colour coding going on. The positive stuff is in green. I feel much better off than I did. I feel slightly better off than I did at 15%. Most people feeling, feeling the same. But still a, a bigger proportion say they feel much worse off or slightly worse off. Now, I think that you know, could be people just being a bit pessimistic as, answering this, this type of question. I think as a, as a research approach, it's all that we have. And I think people are a bit... A bit Probably their real feelings are slightly more positive than reflected here, but still, you know, they're hardly sort of uh, jumping through hoops of joy yet. Uh, just to keep the theme going, um, I think these are some indicators about um, people's concerns, and um, gradually they're kind of moving in the direction. And yet, if you look at the far right, there's still less than a third of us, and stubbornly sort of rigid, who, who say we're, we're over the worst of the downturn. Again, I think possibly exaggerates it's that, that sentiment, but it's what people feel like, uh, feel like saying when they complete research studies such as ours. And I think that's quite, you know, it's sufficiently interesting in itself. It might be how they feel they can consume if, they, you know, if when, when dealing with us, and this was actually, this is done online, so there wasn't, there's no interviewer effect there. But pick, I think the mood might be a bit more optimistic than we're picking up here, but there's still quite high levels of concern. Um, and consumer confidence is rising gradually. Um, so if you ask people about their view of the, their own personal financial situation in the next year, uh, apart from the, the slide, the, the, the bar on the far right is we ask them longer term, how do you think you'll do in the next, th your, your household finances will do in the next three to four years? So you see a much more pos positive view for the, for the medium term, not unlike, but not unlike business, again, uh, and a gradual improving in terms of consumer confidence um, for, for, for the short term. But still a lot of caution with the hope, I think, uh, of, of, of better times to come in the, in the medium term. And I think the, the way you could kind of sum up, sum up this consumer mood is um, we hope for better, we expect better, but not just yet. And I'm not, most of us are not really feeling it yet. As well in terms of the, the consumer mood, again, I, I mentioned this earlier, a bit, a bit like uh, the, the combination of social and economic trends in, the, in terms of the global context. There's um, a lot that's gone on in the last few years that isn't anything to do with economics. Uh, uh, that actually is also is really colouring the mood um, about, about about businesses. It's about uh, institutions like the NHS screwing up, the police um, screwing up with Hillsborough and and the Lawrence case, horse uh, horse meat in food, the BBC, the court court bank, people paying their taxes. Should Primark have been doing rather more in in Bangladesh for health and safety? The energy oh. companies. Screwing this off. I mean, this is, as a slide, this is a kind of gift that keeps on it keeps on giving. We just note at the b bottom here, you know, with apologies to any companies or institutions that we've we've missed out. Um, you know, the, the, the Church of England and so on. I mean, they, it really it, it really is a corporate corporate tax situation. And I think this is a, another feature, as well as the kind of economic catastrophe that people have endured, that is is colouring the consumer mood. And it's producing what we're calling a, the, the the new morality. So we've got economic stagnation, we've got perceived institutional and business malpractice, 
Austerity in public fin finances, meeting what was already a long pre-existing trend towards increased individualization, concern for the self, manifesting itself in a whole host of trends, outward trends about increased focus on corporate governance and, uh, and, and, and uh, you know, behaviour, how many bo you know, what bonuses are you, uh, are, you, are you paying your senior executives, what kind of hospitality are you throwing, those, those kind of, that's what we mean by C-suite scrutiny. What we're also calling the self-preservation society, there's been a complete shrinking in concern about wider issues about like global climate change, there have been lots of issues, in the UK there's a lot of concern about flooding if you live in Somerset but much less is concerned about, glo about global issues. So much more, you know, ethic any ethical concerns, it's kind of transformation of the corporate social responsibility agenda, actually. So any ethical concerns that you have, they're much closer to home, much more personal, much more about me. And hence our, our view there that if you could think of a trend that we saw towards citizen brands over uh, many years ago, in fact, my business partner, Michael Wilmot, wrote a book of that title uh, uh, at the turn of the millennium. It's now much more about individual brands and the corporate social responsibility being, being around those things. So just one manifestation of the, of the, the kind of the, the mood in, in, in which the, the, we live. And I think it would be a mistake for any business that's been kind of um, implicated in the economic disasters of the last couple of years to think that they've got away with it. Um, I don't think they have. And other things, you know, not least of that, the, all the whole literature at the moment, not least Paul Mason's excellent book about youth without a future, high levels of youth and employment. It's coming down, thankfully, in the UK, but around Europe, incredibly, incredibly high. So I think these things, as well as the economics, are incredibly important in terms of shaping the consumer mood going forward. Now, to possibly the most important bit, what does all this mean uh, for marketing? And again, there, there are probably a hundred or a thousand implications for marketing uh, in, in, in all this. I'm going to pick on a few that are, are top of mind and happily debate others uh, in the questions or whatever else comes. Now, what we've seen in the course of the downturn were, and this is an attempt as part of our Visit England work actually, we also do, we've done this a few times with other clients, is look at the coping strategies that people adopted during the course of the downturn. Did, they, did their consumption behaviour change in any way? So were you going out less? Um, and is this something you started as part of the recession? And so on. So this is people, the, the numbers along the top here, the 56%, the 46%, the 56% that you see there, those are the people who say they do this, and they've, they've started doing it as a result of the downturn. So that's, that's the proportion of people who do that behaviour. What you have in the bars here is their view on whether they'll, stop do, uh, whether they'll stop doing this in the near future, in blue, whether they'll stop doing this but it will not be in the near future, or whether they're pretty confident they're not going to stop adopting this kind of recessionary um, stimulated um, behaviour. I think one of the things that emerges really clearly here is the way that the expectation is, if you look at using a cheaper supermarket or using energy more carefully, the way that everyday expenditure, the people expect that everyday expenditure is still going to be nailed to the floor, actually, this, this discretionary thrift, even if your circumstances uh, are improving, that actually you still want to keep that under control and, you know, getting off for three, more than three quarters of people saying, we're not going to stop doing those things, um, using a cheaper supermarket using a cheaper supermarket, try to keep control of my energy bills. We're not going to see people stop doing that. But in some of these more uh, discretionary areas uh, uh, that happen, perhaps purchases that happen less frequently, you can see signs that the reins are more likely to be loosened, which is very good news for my cl client at Visit England, because more holidays, money's going to be on holidays. Let's hope they're in England. Um, and buying clothes um, and, and indulging in a, few more, in a few more luxuries. So some of these leisure areas, as opposed to the everyday spending on food and utilities, are likely to, to bounce back um, slightly more strongly. And not just the research data saying this, the, the performance of the supermarkets, if you look at you know, using a cheaper supermarket, the actual market is bearing this out. The 35% the, uh, year-on-year growth for, for Aldi um, and 17.2% growth for Lidl. I'm sure they're not like for likes. That would be impossible for like for likes. I'm sure it reflects to some extent growth in the number of those stores, but that's obviously reflecting their confidence if they're, if they're opening more stores. And rather more trouble times for the likes of uh, Tesco, Asda uh, uh, and Sainsbury. So I think the market is actually bearing, bearing this out. One final thought I'd like to leave you with, um, thank you, um, is... I've got a bit fed up, actually, of um, coming along to things like this and people talking about this cliché of the, of the savvy consumer. And I think it's time we refine that a little bit. And um, 
a savvy consumer I is out there, and the way we're thinking about this at the moment is drawing a distinction between what we're calling uncompromising consumers, and I think they're the savvy consumer, but I think given what I've talked about in terms of the just sheer scale and duration of this downturn and some of the other things that have been happening in society, I think you've got a really significant group of, uh, that's not really, the best way to um, characterise them isn't about describing them as savvy, it's about describing them as compromised. I just want to explain this finally a little bit more about what I mean about that. So the un uncompromising consumer is the confident consumer. It's the ones that, um, whose incomes are stable or going up, and they approach the market with, with positivity. They've got access to fantastically new digital means of getting information. Of course they have, and they use that, that technology, and they use their power as consumers to drive better deals from the consumers, from the companies they choose to do business with. And I think those are the people we hear about a lot, so I'm going to gloss over those really quickly. What we've done an, anal an analysis of, and it's, it's com it's, um, com uh, we sat it alongside some analysis done by the European Commission of Consumer Behaviour, and our numbers across different surveys just about balance up. The uh, European Commission found about a third of consumers, on our data that we gather, we found 27% of consumers that might be described as compromised consumers. In fact, they're not confident, they feel let down, they were concerned about being uh, ripped off, they don't feel con in control. Uh, they feel under time pressure, uh, and, and so on. They, they uh, are in fact in danger, of, for, in terms of marketeers should be interested in this, and there's an opportunity here, of turning away from some markets because of their lack, their lack of confidence. And this isn't just, this, you, you might, what you might expect is, well, this must be poorer consumers who have been uh, really uh, hammered by the downturn. None of it, actually. Uh, in terms of indexes, there's, there's quite an even spread. And certainly, for, in middle incomes, it's 35% of households on middle incomes between 20 and 40,000 pounds. Bear in mind, the average household income is 26,000 pounds. And actually, well represented up, up into households with 70,000 pounds. Beyond that, beyond 70,000 pounds, they, they do start to drop off. It's, it's people in full time. It's anybody under the age of 55. Again, to be fair, over 55s don't form such a big part of this compromised consumer group. And so, just finally, I think there's a, there's a, uh, a, a real opportunity for brands if you help out this group. Uh, they're not lost to you and they're not poor. So uh, helping them with choice and control, with their anxiety about their decisions, about facing complexity and facing time pressure, which is what I'm under right now. And so finally, um, <laughs> My conclusions, the macroeconomy is, is recovering, but that's not really translating into positivity for most people yet. They live in the hope of a better tomorrow, and that hope is there, and it certainly wasn't there a while back, so let's be thankful for that. The recovery, as far as it's going, is polarised and multi-speed. Um, different types of consumer, public sector versus private sector, I think it's particularly interesting, uh, and different parts of the country are going to recover at different, uh, at different speeds. And there's a significant recessionary hangover in terms of a lot of the trends that, you know, this focus on price, particularly for, on essentials, focus on boardroom practice will remain there. And I think we hope that, that it's reasonably insightful to talk about this compromise versus uncompromising consumer. And both, I think, represent challenges, but they also, to end on an upbeat note, they also represent opportunities too. Thank you very much.